Cool. Um, well, we just get the format sorted out. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, where should I stand then? <laughs> uh, first of all, a massive thank you to Zenke uh, for putting up this conference again and pouring all of his energy uh, into bringing us here today, um, especially on a gloomy day like this in Berlin. I uh, thank you all so much for coming all the way through. Um, it's my second time being here in this. Oh, cool. Here we go. Perfect format. Um, it's my second time being here. Uh, so we first came to the Blockchain for Science conference last year. I had a really amazing time. Um, the crowd last year was a lot bigger. Um, I think which is a good show of tale of like how the crypto economy and the blockchain economy is changing. Um, I think last year there was a lot more hype, still kind of pushing the topic forward. Um, as Zenka kind of said, we came out of that entire ICO boom. A um, lot of money moving around the space. Now it's kind of stabilizing. And I think with that stabilization kind of stays like a stable, how do you say in German, der, der harte Kern. <laughs> the, like the core of the community remains. Um, yeah, so really excited to have you all here today. Um, my name is Paul Kohlhaas. I'm going to present to you today about new avenues for scientific funding. And specifically with that, give an intro to, to Molecule Protocol and how we think about scientific funding there and uh, what, what really needs to change. Cool. Perfect. Everything's working. <laughs> okay. So quickly with the agenda, um, I'm going to give a quick intro to myself, how I came about doing this. Um, I want to talk about scientific funding and intellectual property more broadly. Then specifically, I want to talk about the problems in pharma today as one example for uh, an area in scientific funding. I want to talk about open science and, and token engineering as a potential solution. Uh, then talking a little bit about bonding curves and curation markets as specific examples of that, give an intro to Molecule, and then talk about our launch and the first projects that we're testing this new scientific funding mechanism with. Um, so it's, it's, it was actually quite cool for me coming back to this conference and thinking how much has happened over the past year. Uh, and I think it's what's generally happening in the blockchain space now. Either you've kind of stopped talking and you're really working on something and making real stuff happen, or you've moved along to like something else. Um, yeah, so thank you all for, for being here again. Cool. How do we fund science today? Um, one, government agencies, um, which do a lot of scientific funding for the public good. Um, government agencies tend to be quite slow, um, which I think we can see more and more uh, in terms of how resource allocations happens on that level. Um, has, have any of you ever applied for a government grant program? Okay, quite a few. How is the, how is the, the UX? Awful. <laughs> Awful. Thank you. <laughs> and insecure. And insecure. Okay. Great. Um, so government agencies have been the dominant source of, of funding um, scientific research. We know how like slow government is, has become over the years. I don't think it's the most efficient resource allocation mechanism, but we don't have a better one. The other one is private companies. Private companies are excellent at funding um, scientific research, but they do it with a lot of bias, um, mostly to serve their shareholder interests or their just like private capital interests. They mostly fund it for intellectual property. Um, then last we have nonprofits, which mostly fund uh, new research for special interests. So this could be like a foundation dedicated specifically to um, a rare type of cancer, um, that kind of thing. Where is the public in all of this? So we talk a lot about public markets, um, like blockchain was really, is really, I think, a technology that enables the public. But in terms of scientific funding, the public is mostly excluded. It's like decisions are being made for us on behalf of the government, mainly. So a lot of taxpayer money ultimately flows into funding scientific research. So this is an, ex an example. I think we completely underestimate the extent of public funding that flows into industry later. Um, this is specifically prominent in the United States. So one example is, um, that NIH contributed to every single one of the 210 new pharmaceutical drugs that were approved from 2010 to 2016. So every one of those drugs was developed with publicly funded money. Um, so collectively, the NIH grant funding for this research was over 100 billion over that period. Yet, like the taxpayer essentially sees none of that because all of those drugs essentially get privatized. Uh, and then specifically in the US, the drug prices ultimately that companies um, bring new medicine to market with are incredibly high. Um, so there's, there's, 
it's a very, uh, in the US specifically, in, in Europe is a little bit different, but it's a very dystopian view of how scientific funding then flows into industry, uh, and the public sees very, very little of that. Um, whoop. So what's the deal with intellectual property anyway? Um, so I think, I think the interesting thing about um, scientific funding is that it often ends in, in IP, but then IP is privatized, yet scientific funding is this public good that we think of, and I think there's a big disconnect there in, in, in terms of how we connect those two things. Uh, so this is the first patent that was ever issued. Uh, it's on, on July 1790 uh, for the invention of potash, which is a new type of fertilizer. Um, and it's really interesting to see how the patent system has evolved since those first inventions, um, or like since that time, it's actually evolved extremely little. Yet it's kind of one of the primary kind of drivers that we use to fund innovation with. Um, and that's something that personally got me really thinking. Like, we really, we're really looking for new avenues for how can we make scientific funding better, yet we don't really link it with how intellectual property innovation works and how society can actually reap the rewards from, um, from IP more broadly. Um, so this system has barely, barely evolved uh, from a legal perspective. Um, what are the big problems in pharma today? So this is what we spend most of our time with. Um, it's incredibly expensive to bring a new drug to market. It costs on average $2.5 billion, up to $2.5 billion. It's very, very slow, so the average time to market is 10 to 12 years, uh, and it's very unprofitable. Um, and so this really speaks a little bit and to like how we can actually monetize science. So most of, most of like the real, like what we talk about science happens here, but it's also at this stage that like the majority of innovation actually takes place and when new, new IP is developed. Um, so this kind of brings me back to like how is the public funding this? Well, the public is funding most of it here and then it gets privatized later on. Um, now, this would be fine, like, this would be fine if it was just the way that it is, but increasingly it's very unprofitable for companies to actually develop drugs and bring them to market. So they're cutting R&D at the base layer, um, which is really cutting into, like, the, like the, the very basic of how we push science uh, forward. Um, so why? Um, drug development is kind of where soft development was 30 years ago. Uh, and I think this can be said of like quite a few scientific industries. Um, we haven't evolved our uh, the way that we engage with science or that we share data more broadly. Um, if you go into a lab and see how people are working there, like still like physically writing down lab notes, uh, being very protective of their research, research going through like many many um, iterations before it finally gets published, um, that's completely different than how software development is working today. Um, so I spent most of the, I spent my, the past four, four to five years working in, deeply in software development. And um, it's, so this was something that I felt when I got into like scientific research was thinking like, what if science was more like software development? So research is freely shared, it's openly forked, um, attributions can be made. Um, and I think there's a quantum leap that we can make if, if the systems that we use to, um, to fund science and to conduct science and to share data were fundamentally more open. Um, so what we need is we need new incentives. So one is open science. Uh, I think open science is, I think, widely misunderstood probably as a concept. I'll just, I often just like to equate open science to, um, to open source software. Um, I think there's a lot of similarities that could be drawn in terms of licensing, in terms of data sharing. Um, and the other is uh, token economics. Um, and I think these are two extremely powerful new concepts um, that would be very valuable to bring together um, because it essentially takes the way that we can fund scientific research like into the public domain um, and it makes it natively, natively public. Um, the other really cool thing that happened in the, so this actually takes me back to IP. So if you think how soft development was done in, uh, in the late 90s, uh, in the late 90s, Microsoft had a um, <coughs> software development essentially monopoly over the market mostly. Uh, and at this point, IBM and, and Macintosh and a lot of the other software companies were getting quite afraid of the monopolistic power that Microsoft had in this market. Everything was patented. Everything was proprietary. 
there was nothing like open source. Like to, to Microsoft, open source was the absolute devil. Uh, and then the Linux Foundation was started specifically to combat this and provide a new path forward uh, in terms of commercialization. Um, and I think the same thing needs to happen in, in the scientific community. Um, so how does this compare? Um, and I'm specifically, again, taking the angle of pharma, but like, how can we compare these two things? Um, so both science and software is very modular and granular in design. So there's different steps to go through. Um, if I don't follow a step correctly, something is going to break down the line. Um, it relies on rigorous testing and security requirements. Um, it has very high R&D costs, so developing software is very expensive, um, but very low marginal production costs. So once I've made that discovery or breakthrough, once I've found that new drug, once I've proved that it's safe, then the marginal cost of production is incredibly low. Um, and the other thing that it has is global scalable impact. Um, so these are some examples of what is being done specifically in, um, in, the, in the pharma scientific research community. So there's one initiative that we're working with, which is called Open Source Malaria. It's from a foundation called Open Source Pharma. Um, they're kind of trying to take these Linux models into pharma. Um, so they're doing all of their work out in the open in an open source GitHub repository. They put in their drug targets, they put all their data there. Uh, it's all open, anyone can join in, anyone can start contributing, researching one of these drug targets. Um, and it's really, really interesting, and they've actually made quite a few progresses or like breakthroughs. But the problem is if they publish any of their research uh, on this GitHub repository, it becomes unpatentable by design. So once you put it out in the open, now I can't claim IP on it anymore. And you'd, we'd all be like, yay, no one can claim IP, like open science. But the problem is that now no one is willing to develop these drugs. Because if we look back, if we look back here, the cost of bringing a drug to market here gets, like, these are just costs that you have to go through to fund the clinical trials, which even for something like malaria would it still be in like the 20 to $50 million range if you actually want to get the FDA approved in the end. Um, which now means, who is gonna, who's gonna front that cost, like, if I can't protect the revenue from it? Like, if I can't guarantee anyone that I'm actually gonna make money to, like, pay back, pay that back. Um, again, this is kind of where often private, um, no, sorry, not private, non-profit funding comes in. So the Gates Foundation to date has funded a lot of malaria research, but still, like, it, they're really struggling to get anything to market. Um, yeah, so big problem, once you do open source it, how do you, how do you actually f fund it, or like how do you commercialize it? Um, this is another example, uh, the community for open antimicrobial drug discovery. Uh, so there's a lot of areas in drug discovery that are, like, that are going into these nonprofit models, but none of them work. So this has been around for five years, they've had some good breakthroughs, but nothing is really like taking foot, no, no, like, no new money is coming in. Uh, so what can we do? Um, Lastly, I want to talk about the big limitations and problems with open science. Again, looking at it through the angle of drug development. So we're still in meat space, so we need physical um, spaces and biologic testing, although a lot of that is increasingly being automated. Um, decision making in open science, and I think in open source is a huge problem. Like how, how do we do go, go versus no go decisions? Should we go with this compound or this compound? It often takes someone's instinct to be like, this is the research direction that we should take regulatory filing and legal liability. If we have a drug that is developed open source by like a consortium of people, who's liable? Who's gonna do the regulatory filing? At the end of the day, you still need a company somewhere. Um, and then, yeah, what are the business models? So this is what I just talked about. How do we create incentives for open source to actually work? Um, do we need new licensing frameworks? Really long. Do we redesign how patents work? Or do we repackage them um, and, and create new forms of IP? Okay, I don't see the time. How am I doing on time? I'm just wondering. Uh, it's still, it's still minutes, so it's okay, cool. Okay, cool. So how do we change systems? Um, so because I've been in the blockchain space for a while, I've, I drank the, the Kool-Aid quite a lot. <laughs> so I think, but I, I actually fundamentally think that token engineering holds a, um, a, a key to a lot of these problems. Um, so what we want to do is we want to design new economic incentive markets because we agree that our current markets are not functioning properly. Then we want to change stakeholder behavior through these new markets. 
Um, and we need to be extremely humble when we approach this. These are really early stage experiments. They're not blueprints. Um, and we want to simulate behavior before testing. Uh, and actually, Michael Zargam, who's just after me, is going to give an amazing, amazing talk on that, I'm assuming. Um, it's very, very early days for this, for this stuff. Cool. So let's look at the problem briefly again. So in drug discovery, what we do, what the whole industry does, is it sifts through this like universe of potential molecules or new proteins or drug targets to then treat a specific disease. Um, but now every company does this individually. So every company is trying to do the same thing and protects all the innovation inside of it just because that's how they get to monetize it. So we went at this and we asked, what if we opened up this thing into like an open market? And there was a really interesting concept that came about in, uh, in I think, late 2016, which was called Curation Markets, pioneered by someone called Simon de la Rouvier, uh, which was essentially um, creating, initially creating markets to trade memes, like any kind of meme on the internet. Anyone could create a market for a meme, be it the Doge meme or, I don't know, a Donald Trump meme or anything, and then people could bet on the popularity of those memes trading tokens. So we thought, cool, couldn't we apply this for more complex situations, like scientific ideas. Zarnke has been talking a lot about this. Like, could we openly fund and trade interest in scientific ideas? And we thought, cool, well, we could also openly trade and fund interest in intellectual property and molecules. Quite a bit more complex, but that's kind of where we're going. Um, so briefly, for anyone who hasn't heard about bonding curves, I want to give a very brief just description. There, it's a new type of smart contract that can create a tokenized market around any type of thing. So you give it any type of asset. And what the smart contract enables is a price discovery mechanism using an algorithm. Um, if you want to ask me more about it, come, come to me afterwards. I don't want to lose myself in the details. Um, but we can basically use this to autonomously fund and uh, enable price discovery for assets that were previously very illiquid. So IP is a very illiquid asset, like a meme is also a very illiquid asset, like what is the value of a meme? Let the people decide. Um, and what they also enable are continuous financing mechanisms. So we can now autonomously finance new, um, these types of assets based on people's interest. Um, and this was kind of born out of all the, like, the, the problems that came with ICOs. Um, so a bonding curve really tries to go against that and, and provide something that is much more reasonable um, in some ways. Um, so the second concept that I want to introduce briefly are uh, CryptoKitties. Um, so Zenka briefly talked about non-fungible tokens. Um, it's really cool. A lot of the great innovation in the blockchain space comes through gaming and, and like just joyful experimentation. Um, so we thought, cool, well, these are like unique digital cats, like pictures of cats that we attach to a non-fungible token on an open network. Well, couldn't we just replace the cat picture JPEG data with data of an actual piece of IP or of a scientific breakthrough? Um, it could be a, a paper, it could be anything. Um, so now we have two really interesting design concepts. This is kind of where token engineering gets interesting. Um, so IP is usually based on patents and proprietary data, so we attach that data to a non-fungible token, uh, and then we set the owner address of that non-fungible token to a bonding curve. And boom, I mean, this is very oversimplified, but now we can trade interest and finance um, IP or new ideas in an open market. Um, so this is essentially, and now the last thing, now these open markets can serve as prediction, as prediction markets for that IP. Because now what you're creating is you're creating an incentive structure for people to release positive data because it's likely to increase the price of the IP or negative data which is likely to decrease the price of the IP. Very, very simple concept. And now you're, you've kind of created this primitive that incentivizes people to publish data more openly because they stand to have an economic gain from it. Um, yeah, it's very interesting what this would do to insider trading. Um, but yeah, that's the base concept. Cool, so maybe just to round it up, what are we doing at Molecule? At Molecule, we're building an open market for, um, for R&D and funding of intellectual property, specifically in, in the farm industry. Um, it's really a distributed marketplace and network that can power these new forms of R&D um, out in the open. Um, what does this look like? It's essentially a two-sided market where IP comes in on the one side, and on the other side, you'd have patients, academia, investors, and pharma that are now collectively able to invest in new drugs and to fund research around them from their earliest stages. 
it's kind of an early screen of what this of what the system looks like. You basically have different types of um, disease targets, different type of IP that is listed on the system, and then developed in an open manner. Um, you can access funding through that. You can access different data that is ascribed to it. Um, you can also define different um, different access rights. Uh, we're launching our first alpha. So. As I kind of said in the beginning, if you're long enough in this space, you really want to build something and then like really start just testing and experimenting. Uh, so we're launching pilots with three early stage therapeutic research projects. Um, one is in air, air rare and orphan diseases, one is in longevity and biogerontology, and one is in psychedelic studies. They're with the University of Johns Hopkins in the US, University of Copenhagen, and University of Toronto. Okay. 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 Cool. Oh yeah, I can see it now. Um, yeah. So basically, what these research projects are doing, they're all in basic research, but there's a chance that that basic research will generate new IP. And so what we're doing is, for the first time, we're funding the research from these institutes, and it's all labs and research at those at those respective institutes, working in those fields. Um, uh, that essentially create a market on our system, and that market now funds their research. So it's like a, it's like a crowdfunded grant, um, but the tokens that the funders receive in that project, um, if the project is successful, can be converted into real IP. Um, and we're testing this at a very small scale. So the markets that we're initially launching are the fund, have funding goals between forty to eighty thousand um, dollars, and they're essentially like consecutive funding rounds based on how well the research is going. Um, so you go through different grants as your research progresses. Um, and now, as a researcher, you have an incentive to continuously upload your data and upload your results, which for us is like a completely different, is a paradigm shift to, uh, I have to, if I get private grant funding, the private grant funder often controls how, when I publish, when I release my research, often also controls some of the IP. Uh, and if not, then I often wait two to three years before I actually publish my results, before I get into nature, or whatever I'm aiming for. So this is really tries to turn that on its head, because the more continuously you release data to your funders, um, the more money you receive. Um, unless your research doesn't go well, but then it probably shouldn't be continued to be funded. Um, yeah, this is um, just a screen of what the early system looks like. Um, what essentially happens, I just explained this. So um, the system will be on mainnet Ethereum um, beginning of this, no, end of this year. We're launching our first market with the University of Toronto. Um, uh, so researchers, uh, funders stake DAI in, and a part, of that, a part of that DAI, which is a stable coin on Ethereum, goes to the researcher. A part of it stays in a reserve pool. Uh, then the researcher continuously releases project results, and the funders get a stake in that project. Um, so these are two of the project examples that we're doing. The first one is a high-impact clinical trial to study the effects of microdosing psilocybin. And the other one is discovering interventions leading to healthy aging and longer lifespan. Um, this one's from the University of Copenhagen. They've essentially screened over 100 different molecules that can prolong human lifespan. And out of those 100, they've selected three. And they're not revealing them. So they're saying, we have molecule X, Y, and Z. And um, if, you if any of these are promising, they will claim IP on one of those compounds, and then whoever funded that in this early stage trial receives a share in that, in that IP. Um, we can talk about the legal as well, ask me privately. <laughs> uh, a lot of things still need to be worked out in how these early economies can interface with our real world legal system, uh, but I think it's a really exciting challenge to, um, yeah, to take that on and try to build new systems that work. Um, yeah, just giving a shout out to Block Science as well. I didn't know uh, Zargon was here, so we're engineering a lot of this. We're trying to simulate a lot of this behavior. Uh, and there's a company called Block Science that has built a really great um, uh, simulation tool called CADCAD, um, where you can essentially simulate a lot of this behavior. You define different parameters, system parameters. Uh, in our case, it would be um, uh, it would be the the curve slopes of the bonding curves that we use, how much the return is going to be. You could model things like pump and dump behavior, so maybe you have someone that comes in and doesn't actually want to fund the project, they just want to like, um, uh, they just want to manipulate the market. Um, yeah, that kind of thing. Cool. Uh, also, a little reminder at the end, there's a workshop this afternoon if you really want to go deeper into these specific topics. Uh, it's called New Deals on Science. It's at 4.30 this afternoon. Uh, led by my co-founder, Devin Kruntz. Um, would love to see you there. 
And I think that workshop will be a much more open discussion. We can dive into some of these tools, um, explore what they do in other areas. Yeah, cool. Thank you so much.